Hi friends, welcome to the course on entrepreneurship. We are into the third module and this module covers uh, two important topics, ideation and prototyping. Before we delve into these two aspects a little deeper, let us once again look at entrepreneurship and uh, startups. The reason is when we are talking about ideation and prototype, we are thinking of an abstract thing called an idea. We are also thinking of a reality, a physical reality called prototype. Now, what is bridging these two? Obviously, technology, engineering. Engineering is bridging ideation and prototyping. But the way technology and engineering works is little different in entrepreneurial firms, completely entrepreneurial firms and completely startup firms. Therefore, let us look at uh, the subtle differences between entrepreneurship and startup before we go into prototyping before that ideation. See, entrepreneurship is something of a movement which looks at continuing business opportunities and takes up takes them up as a new projects. So, in a way it is a kind of follow on activity with little uh, creativity in the way you conduct your business. And the goals of an entrepreneurial firm are usually in terms of scale, revenue, profits, etc. And the goal of a typical entrepreneur is how fast I can get into the mainstream industrial uh, business that is the goal. On the other hand, the startup looks at uh, certain unserved needs or certain needs which could be served by new technologies. Therefore, it is a question of gap identification around novel products and services. And invariably, an, a startup is an innovative activity. It looks at product innovation or process innovation and looks at being first to market. As I said in my earlier class also, an entrepreneurial firm can flourish without being first to market. They can be more cost efficient, they can have a more creative business model, they can deploy their resources more productively and therefore achieve market share. Or they can simply cater to the expanding market of an emerging country like India and then become entrepreneurial in whichever field they are working. On the other hand, the startup firm is definitely an innovative activity doing some things for the first time. And the goals as opposed to mainstream entrepreneurial activity are in terms of uh, proving the concept, converting an idea from uh, an abstract concept to a real physical activity. And another goal is not merely revenue, my, how do I get my firm valued? So the market valuation or valuation by the equity investors of the firm is a very important goal for the startup firm. Whereas for an entrepreneurial firm, the valuation comes as a result of the scale, scope, the revenue performance, the profit performance, performance, etc. And as far as the entrepreneurial firm is concerned, the intent is to stay in the business as long as one can and grow the business and become as large as one can. On the other hand, a startup firm looks at even monetization. That is, once you develop a prototype successfully, you see the first commercialization. You might like to do it as a perfectly legitimate operation. There is nothing uh, wrong about that in startup. Obviously, both entrepreneurial firm and startup firm take risks because they start with lower level of uh, resources. But the startup firm takes significant additional risks of innovation. Now, what are those risks of innovation? Innovation is something doing for the first time in the world. So, we are converting an experimental thought into an experimental product idea and then converting again into an experimental commercialization idea. Obviously, there is a uh, risk involved whether this idea is technically feasible, is this idea commercially viable. Secondly, the risk is that innovation typically takes long time and a startup does not have that much of time or resource to conduct the experimentation the way one would like to have. Therefore, there is always a likelihood, always a risk that the product development could be suboptimal. It could not be what somebody would like that to be. Then there is also another risk that the innovator tends to like the product so much or simply the innovator does not have enough time to go through different types of testing which we will come into later that he would straight away put the product into the mass market. Therefore, uh, it could be rejected while uh, the product is expected to be tested in phases and therefore improved upon. Once you reach a product directly to the mass market, there is a great risk of failure. 
The other issue is that the startup founders usually deal in sunrise technology. They do it uh, for the first time. Technically compatible uh, stakeholders are there in the ecosystem. Therefore, the vendors who support the uh, startup with new technology are likely to be lagging behind. Therefore, there is a technological mismatch between the core technology of the startup and the technical components supplied by various other vendors. Therefore, the ultimate product is uh, instead of being a high tech hybrid, it could end up being a compromise. Then obviously, there are some knowledge gaps between the founders, between the product developers, the component makers. On the other hand, there is also this uh, threat or the risk that there are other people who are working on uh, these kinds of projects and they are coming up with uh, improved innovation. So this is competitive innovation. Again, looking at this, the entire startup activity or the entrepreneurial activity is based on three hypotheses. First is the technology hypothesis that if you do this kind of uh, development, this is going to work well. Like for example, you may say that I can get an analog watch with uh, 20 year uh, battery life as a theoretical possibility. Is it possible? Yes, it is possible if you are able to combine the kinetic movement along with the battery movement. But typically the optimization of these two cycles could fail in the product. Therefore, the technology hypothesis could fail at the product level. The second, when you take the product to the consumer, at the consumer level, the product hypothesis could fail. And thirdly, the demand hypothesis that if you do a product of this nature and prototype it and prove it, it will find its niche in the marketplace that could fail. Therefore, there are enough number of risks in innovation that one should be very careful how we deploy innovation for taking these startup firms and entrepreneurial firms going forward. So that is where this entire issue of uh, ideation and uh, prototyping comes. So to summarize everything in a nutshell, we need balanced product development. We also need optimal business impact. How do, how do these occur? You can have a very perfect product development by working on it for several years and making sure that this product is the best one can produce. But likely more people will come into the market. Likely the demand for that kind of technology itself may change. Therefore there is an issue in doing things uh, for a long time. Therefore, there is an anxiety or compulsion of early launch and for quick business results. When we say quick business results, it is reasonable, one year, two years, etc. On the other hand, there are these rigors of uh, very stringent product development requiring iterative prototyping and perfection. So, the challenge is to establish the fine balance between robust product development and timely business impact. Now again these aspects are done when we go through a very structured phase of ideation and prototyping. So let us recall what we talked about as the broad stages of product development in an entrepreneurial form. First we have ideation that is understanding what the customer needs which he could not express but which we have discovered which is the ideation phase. Second is uh, prototyping, third is uh, testing. Fourth is validation of this entire concept that if you get this product as we have uh, defined, we are going to get some good demand hypothesis or good market hypothesis. So that is the validation phase. And finally, the fifth phase is commercialization. Now in this module, we are looking at uh, item number one, which is ideation and item number two, prototyping. I would also like to say that as part of ideation, we also have one precursor phase which is called empathization. Empathization is a way of getting the ideas to fruition by understanding the customer needs. I have not shown it as a separate phase, but there is a body of knowledge called design thinking, which is pioneered by Stanford, which says that empathizing is a precursor to ideation and should be treated as one of its own in this whole developmental cycle. So how does this ideation to commercialization, how does it uh, work, how does the process flow work? I am going to give you 3-4 examples. Let us look at the automobile industry. First we will have a conceptual ideation. The concept ideation could be that yes, you should have a completely dominant uh, front grille, you should have uh, fog lamps and tail lamps with the LED uh, systems, you should have GPS, you should have a fluidic design various other kinds of conceptual designs will be there 
and you must also be thinking that you must enlarge the boot space, you should uh, minimize the bonnet space, things like that. So once you have, you will get conceptual ideation. Then you try to fit it in the wheelbase, overhang, rear overhang, overhang parameters, the height, etc. This is the technical design phase. Once you get these two done, Typically, an automobile manufacturer or the design uh, department of the automobile manufacturer does some clay modeling. It is called studio prototyping with hands. Even in this time, people would like to feel the contours, feel the shape, feel the aer aerodynamic drag, etc. And they develop a model of the car or the automobile you do. Once you do that, you get into the laboratory prototyping. At the laboratory prototype stage, you also do the testing and evaluation. For example, you can uh, subject it to the noise test, how does the engine rev and what kind of noise it produces. You can perform a crash test, you can perform a acceleration test. So these are all possible in a laboratory testing and evaluation. Once you do that, you have got enough inputs to do a technical redesign which is kind of optimization of the design. Once you do that, you will go into the field. Now this field could be your own field where you have a huge test track including a torture track which simulates the road conditions in a very uh, extreme compressed cycle. Once you do that, you have this testing and evaluation results and you get into the final technical optimization. At that point of time, the product is ready for commercial manufacturing release, which is then followed by commercial release. Why are we distinguishing between manufacturing release and commercial release? Because even though the product has been developed in the laboratory, optimized in the field and redeveloped there is always a possibility that the components may not be turned out the way you want because the manufacturing infrastructure is set. It is already there manufacturing a different type of product and you are uh, kind of leveraging it to develop this new genre of products. So these are the steps. So if you look at it, you have phase 1 which is essentially laboratory optimization. You have phase 2 which is essentially field optimization. So this is as far as the automobile industry is concerned. Let us look at another uh, example. This example is one of the bulk drug or the active pharmaceutical ingredient. When you look at a formulation, that is the medicine which we take, the pill, the capsule, it has got inside the basic drug that is called the active pharmaceutical ingredient. And then when it is packaged or it is uh, filled in or it is uh, compressed into a tablet capsule or uh, uh, even a liquid dosage form, that is for called formulation. The development cycle for both these kinds of things are uh, similar but are also different. But let us look at this. When you look at an active pharmaceutical ingredient, you do a paper chemistry saying that this molecule has got this synthetic process. And why do we do that? Because we want to do it in a way it does not infringe on any of the patents which are available. So for the same molecule with the same end structure, there are several routes which are possible. Such routes should be patent non-infringing, such routes should be cost competitive, such routes should be compatible with the manufacturing infrastructure one you have. And the most important thing in the pharmaceutical in industry is to ensure that whatever you have developed is proven by analytical methods like uh, HPLCs and uh, mass spectra and several other sophisticated uh, equipment. So that the product which you are taking which is chemical is characterized to the fullest extent and its safety and purity are well established. So this is called process and analytical development. Once you do that you do the testing and evaluation and you do it in pilot batch in pilot plant. Why are we doing pilot batch in pilot plant? This is very unique to the pharmaceutical industry because you cannot manufacture on a full scale a drug unless it is approved. And you cannot take the risk of manufacturing the product on uh, let us say 100 ton basis unless you know that it is getting to be approved. But at the same time, the regulators that is the Food and Drug Administration cannot approve a drug unless they are sure that it meets the requirement. So there is this concept of pilot plant that is you have a pilot plant which is let us say 1 by 100 of the full scale uh, manufacturing plant which means that as long as the experimental parameters are maintained, what you produce in the pilot plant is likely to be fulfilled in the final uh, destination manufacturing plant. So once you do the pilot plant, then you do the technical evaluation much like what you do in automobile, then you do the laboratory op optimization. Then comes what we call exhibit batch. 
exhibit batch is something where uh, you do it just as though it is a manufactured product record everything batch manufacturing got how much solvent is going inside how much solvent is coming out what are the nitrogen blanketing you are doing and various other things once you do this you will get the product out and the product has to withstand the stability a product can be uh, stable in the normal uh, room conditions for uh, 5 years but product can be unstable also and it may require even uh, cold chain or being in uh, uh, very uh, protected conditions like a vaccine like a biological molecule or like a probiotic they require uh, 2 to 8 degrees or some be below 0 degrees so stability study is very important once this chemical entity is proved by the stability study you you prepare what you call a drug master file and that drug master file gets approved by the regulatory authority then the plant gets inspected by the regulatory authority and you are ready for the commercial release there the manufacturing release and commercial release are combined because the regulator has actually inspected the plant and has cleared based on the drug master file which you have submitted so, so if you see the automobile example and you see this uh, active pharmaceutical ingredient example you find that the process is more or less similar but there is lot of emphasis here on traceability in automobile industry as long as the final product meets the requirement you are not really concerned as to how the component has been produced what were the parameters at which the component has been produced whereas here you would like to characterize all the deviations therefore the traceability the computer system validation the data integrity they become very important now a startup can do these kinds of products very well because they are of pilot scale and once you do it at the exhibit batch level you have already established the product and probably you can market that concept to global big pharma now when you look at the finished dosage form what has happened similar to the paper chemistry we have paper formulation here similar to the process and analytical research we have uh, formulation and analytical development then you do the testing and evaluation pilot batch technical evaluation the only difference here is that instead of calling it uh, uh, drug master file we call it abbreviated new drug application we call it abbreviated new drug application because a new drug is always uh, approved as a new drug application with lot of clinical data whereas when you are introducing a generic product we just do a bioequivalence study to prove that in blood stream it goes in the same way as the original medicine and that's why it's called abbreviated new drug and you go through the same kind of process and get commercial release again if you look at it there are two phases <coughs> laboratory scale up of formulation and pilot scale up of formulation now let's look at uh, the software industry again there are two phases one is development optimization the second is the field optimization in the development optimization you are looking at the overall business processes adopted by the company then you develop the system architecture then you get into the coding then you do the alpha testing at the development center once you do that you are near the system and code optimization after that you give it to the users they do it in their field they do the beta testing again the feedback loop and you do the system and code the optimization you pilot roll out so when you look at it what is uh, very evident here there is an early phase where you do this process study and system design the ideation phase then there is also a prototyping phase the product could be physical like an automobile or a bulk drug or a formulation it could be a kind of uh, service oriented uh, system like uh, software but still there is an ideation phase there is a prototyping phase and as we can see the prototyping phase itself goes through successive iterations now how does this whole thing happen how do people develop uh, new products there are uh, you can look at it in a three way grid the first dimension of the grid is the theme which is this what is the theme of this product on under what proposition are we making this product and under what conditions we believe the customer will uh, approve this second is the strength of our company the strength of the team to make it so what are the common threads which we have to make this theme work and thirdly the passion what is our emotional attribute by which we can contribute to the development
So, to give little more uh, thing, you look at a thematic grid. The thematic grid could be anything. You can say that it is customization, it could be aggregation, it could be analytics, it could be digitization, it could be search. So, when you look at a company like Redbus.in, what did they do? Like Uber, they aggregated. When you look at Make, Make My Trip, they are doing customization, the customization of the cheapest possible fare. When you look at uh, Airbnb, they are uh, releasing the rooms which are lying idle and then they are providing to the guests who want to have a different uh, hotel space. And how does that happen? It happens through a combination of uh, search and analytics. So, there is a thematic grid which drives the demand supply match in several uh, startups. I have given you here nine uh, startups which have their thematic grid. Everybody would have seen uh, Paperboat. It is a new kind of flexible uh, beverage format that has been introduced and uh, you can see it quite uh, popularly in the aeroplanes. So, what it does? It has two ways of uh, making it differentiated. One, it does the traditional Indian beverage and it does contemporary packaging which is different. So, they have been able to get a thematic grid which is quite different from juice given in the tetra pack uh, container. You look at lunch box, they have decided at first to give school children the best possible nutritious food. So, graded nutrition for different kinds of uh, school going children with customized delivery. So, there is a thematic uh, matrix here. Then we look at Ola or Uber, we have got aggregation of demand and supply and we have got the delivery vehicle which is called the cab. Then we look at uh, B, report B, then you have data analytics, you got performance mentoring. Grey orange, it applies robotics to warehousing operations. Blue gap, whatever customer has got in terms of developing an idea into a theme, it does digital printing. So, from combining the customer idea with the digital printing capabilities, the company has been set up. Zomato, it started with a review of uh, hotel business, food business, rating business. Therefore, they have developed a huge analytical base, huge restaurant contacts and then they added on that choices and delivery options. Therefore, a new food delivery business has been established. Similarly, voice application and cloud hosting, customer loyalty and monetization, they have supported two other companies. So, you look at uh, any company which has come into being in a new fashion, you will find that there are two dimensions of uh, thematic grid. So, when you say that um, uh, I want to introduce a new smart watch, obviously you can follow a Fitbit Versa or Apple watch. But on the other hand, you say that I will have this style of an analog watch as the x axis and the digital capability of an Apple watch as the y axis, then you are doing a smart analog watch. You are not doing a digital watch, you are doing a smart analog watch. So, like that you can always uh, come up with a number of uh, modifications to the product dimensions and come up with your own uh, theme. Then we also spoke about uh, common thread. To be able to do this thematic matrix, to do the thematic grid, the organization or the founding team, they should have some uh, com competencies. These competencies, if you look at only one competency, it is like a thread. But if you intertwine those competencies and make them into three or four competencies rolled into one, like you see the threads getting into rope, which is strong, you will find the same analogy working in the startup also. So, there are four uh, co common threads which are there in many good startups. One is <coughs> innovation the ability to think in an innovative way and create a new product. Second is acumen. Acumen is the ability to spot something which others are not able to spot and also deliver that product in a more competitive way. That is the acumen. The third one is the experience or the learning curve. The more you do something, the better you are at it. So, you have been able to focus on let us say highly optimized battery development as part of your coursework or as part of your research work, you have gained lot of core competence in that area. So, that is the experience part. And fourth of course, is education, continuous learning and ability to continuously innovate. For example, when uh, a digital watch is uh, developed, the healthcare sector was not capable 
of analyzing the blood sugar parameters based on the sweat. But today that kind of technology is getting available. So this is possible through continuous education of whatever is happening. So we can say that one is the thread of knowledge and skill, second is the thread of functionality and application and use, the third is the thread of product service business and the fourth one or the first one actually is the thread of idea, innovation, experimentation, convergence. Now when you add all these four threads, the company gets a very strong rope, the strength of the common thread. So we have this thematic matrix on one side, we have got this common thread on the other side. Now these threads emerge over time and evolution. Let us take this lunchbox itself. So what was the first uh, iteration? It had got delivered food and it started with food for school children. Then it can be expanded further. You can provide food for elderly. Then you can follow it up for food for entire family. Then you can get into food for offices and factories. So this is one vertical which you have been able to develop based on thematic matrix initially started of graded nutrition versus customized delivery. And then you have expanded your market segments. Now that you have done one item called food, you can have other deliverable products. It could be a processed food, it could be groceries, it could be fruits and vegetables, it could be ready to eat foods. So what happened? The thematic matrices have been expanded. The common threads have been strengthened and you have been using certain delivery mediums. Originally probably you had used two wheelers, but when you went, go into these kinds of complete uh, bouquet of uh, products and services, then you might get into trucks, you might get into drones. So how do you, once you do that, what is the service medium? I can do it through courier services, I can have my own dedicated counters. So when you see from this combination which the startup had initially, it is moving over a period of time through evolution of the thematic matrix, it is moving through the evolution and the strengthening of the common threads to get into a completely new business conglomerate kind of situation. So you have to keep in mind therefore that by combining the specific components of your activity, be it the product, be it the process, be it the delivery mechanism you are able to create new businesses of thematic matrix, new businesses of common threads. So the journey is iterative, it is a continuously evolving uh, situation.